quindi ok everyone so uh, let us carry on 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 are you ready okay okay <laughs> All right. Oh, hard to. Okay, so it's getting late in the day, so people are getting. I don't know. Are you getting a bit restless, or are you okay? Are you all right? <laughs> okay, so we're we're gonna continue just a little bit more, uh, and uh, I'm gonna look at a uh, sutta called the uh, Tapusa Sutta, and this is a sutta you probably have never heard of before, so it's going to be new to you, and it's not a sutta that you have probably heard many people talk about or anything like that. And we're going to carry on with this idea of how the Buddha is kind of establishing right view and how that then leads to right intention. Now we're going to look more, this is going to be more into the realm of the, the sensory world, the five sense, senses, what is often called sensual pleasures. And I want to make the point that when we talk about sensual pleasures, I think it is very often talked about in the wrong way. Very often people think that that means that we should not enjoy our food. People think it means we should not enjoy our relationships. People think it means that we should have no fun in life. But actually, it's the wrong way of thinking about this. The idea with letting go of this five sense world is really more about uh, letting go more globally of the idea that that world is very interesting. Uh, we can still enjoy ourselves in that world, but we also understand the limitations of that world. Uh, and this is actually the critical thing that allows the mind to go into samadhi. And that is why it is so important. Uh, so the way I would uh, encourage you to think about this is more like a global idea of the problem of the five sense world. Let go of that whole world a little bit. And as you do that, the mind inclines more to the spiritual path, and that is what enables samadhi to happen. Keep on going to nice restaurants. Keep on keep, keep on doing the things in the world. That is not the problem. The problem is more the global idea of these things, yeah? And then you're going to be on the right track, yeah? The purpose of these things is to learn to reflect in the right way. Yeah, is learn these are going to be ways of reflecting about the world, ways of thinking about the world. And as you reflect in this way, it will happen automatically that you turn in a certain direction. This is not something that you should force yourself to do. That. You shouldn't make yourself kind of give up things that you find happy in the world. It is more a way of reflecting. And as you reflect like that, as the right view falls into place, according to the Buddha, these things will happen automatically. Right intention will arise, and then uh, right meditation, all of these things will happen as a consequence. So, now, it is difficult to overestimate how important this actually is. You may uh, remember that you have uh, three asavas. Asavas are sometimes called the outflowings of the mind. Uh, these are like the root defilements of the mind, uh, the asavas. Uh, and the three asavas are the uh, uh, the calm asava, the bhava asava, and the avijja asava. The calm asava is the outflowing of the defilement of the mind. that has to do with the five sense world. Uh, yeah, that's one of them. Second one, bhava asava, is the Defilement that has to do with existence or attachment to existence itself. This is the second one. The large one, Avijjasava, is the defilement that has to do with ignorance or delusion at the very root of the mind. Of these three, the last one, Avijjasava, is not so important because it doesn't really add much to the two first ones. What does it add? Well, it's not clear that it adds anything because the Bhavasava. Uh, which is the defilement that has to do with attachment to existence. That is actually really the kind of the final hurdle that we pass on the way to awakening. Yeah, Giving up the attachment to existence is very, very profound. And it's very similar to the idea of delusion. Yeah? But prior to that, before we can do that, we have to give up this defilement of, of the five sense world. Yeah? Yeah, that is the root problem that stops us from attaining the deep meditation of samadhi, the samadhi that then enables the insight that lets go of the bhava asava. So the karma asava has to go first, the defilement of 
five sense world, then that enables samadhi, which then enables us to also let go of the defilements of attachment to existence, the bhavasana. There's a natural sequence here. There. And so you can see that these very rude defilements of the mind is really only two. Attachment to existence, attachment to the five sense world. This is how important it is, the attachment to the five sense world. It gives access to the samadhi, the things that actually enable the eradication of all the defilements of the mind. This is the hardest one to let go of. Once you have that, once you have access to samadhi, the rest of the path is so happy and so enjoyable. Yeah, It's kind of easy compared to the first part. This is why we are looking at this, yeah. To, especially for those of you who are interested in deepening your meditation practice. Uh, this is very important. Uh, now, you may remember that when we talk about the, uh, uh, we often talk about the five hindrances as the uh, uh, the things that stop us or obstruct us from attaining meditation, right? Five hindrances. Now, of these five hindrances, it is important to understand which ones are the most important ones. Uh, what are the things we should focus on? Uh, now, the last three, the uh, uh, the um, tiredness and lethargy, the restlessness and remorse and the doubt, uh, they are very much a result of the first two. The first two are by far the most important because they also give rise to the last three. Uh, so the first two is what I would recommend you to focus on. Uh, now, of those first two, the most detrimental one that is very destructive for your spiritual practice and also for your meditation is the second one is ill will yeah ill will is a very very detrimental one so i would the primary purpose of practice of meditation and your spiritual life should be to overcome ill will and upset irritation that kind of defilement that is really the most important one because it is very detrimental and it is quite easy to overcome but if you really try to overcome ill will, I can guarantee you that you will succeed. Uh, and the reason is because actually the ideas that we use to overcome ill will, the ideas that especially relating to other people, seeing other people as traffic lights, yeah, I've told you this, this already, seeing them as robot, understanding that people don't really know what they're doing. These are very powerful perceptions. If you build those up very quickly, and you can, you can overcome ill will. I wouldn't say easily, but it can be done by anyone. So it, that it should be the number one focus. But the second focus uh, should be on the five sense world. Uh, in five, the five sense world is really the root of all of these five hindrances. Uh, if you want to say that the one thing is the cause of everything else, it is the five sense world. Uh, so the five sense world, attachment to that, the karma chanda, is what usually also gives rise to ill will because we get our desires in that world thwarted and we don't get to enjoy what we want to enjoy. And so we get upset and angry. It's kind of a natural consequence of not getting what you want in the world. The five sense world also gives rise to restlessness and remorse. Yeah, restlessness because karma chanda, the pursuit of that world, is a very restless kind of pursuit. So it is very important for the restlessness. If you pursue too much in the five sense world, you also get tired, you get lethargy, because the mind that is always restless, always moving on in that world of the five senses, it depletes its energy. Yeah, It gives up the energy, it uses it up on pursuing things in that world. And then you can feel very tired after you have kind of uh, been running around pursuing sensual pleasures all the time. Uh, and doubt also is part of this problem, because as long as you have sensual pleasures, uh, as long as you're pursuing the five senses, uh, it means that uh, uh, the mind is not clear about wholesome qualities. Uh, and that is, the, in effect, what doubt is about, not understanding the distinction between wholesome and unwholesome. So this is the root of all defilements. Uh, and the reason why I say, you, so you might argue, maybe we should just focus on that. Why did I say ill will, first of all? Well, because ill will is very detrimental and very bad. That's why I should focus on that first. Uh, but uh, if you want to focus on the root, uh, which eventually you should, uh, you need to also consider the five sense world. Uh, but consider it again, as I'm talking about, in a large perspective, yeah? The problem of this world, the way we have been talking about now, that there are problems of violence, there are problems of never really being satisfied, uh, there are problems of making bad karma in the pursuit of these things. And I guarantee you, 
that eventually you will make bad karma in the pursuit of the satisfaction of the five sense world. And because you make bad karma and do stupid things, eventually it leads to a bad rebirth. Yeah. Do you really want to be reborn as a ghost in your next life? How many people would like to be ghosts in the next life? Nobody wants to be a ghost, right? It's kind of obvious because ghosts are suffering. Do you want to be reborn as an animal in the next life? No good, right? If you are reborn as a mosquito, a lot of people are going to harm you. So it's a bad idea to be reborn as an animal in the next life. We don't want that. But the five sense world, the pursuit of that world, has a tendency to lead to these kind of things. That's why it is so detrimental. There's a nice sutta I've been... I was looking at recently, found in the Itti Vuttaka. I uh, mentioned that as part of the Kudukanaka, I mentioned that before. Uh, and the Itti Vuttaka is a very interesting collection that was remembered by a lay woman. It's very rare for lay women to have a whole collection that they remembered. Uh, but this was the case. And then she passed those that collection on to the monks, and then it was became part of the uh, t- uh, Tipitaka, or the Sutta Pitaka, as we have it now. Uh, And one of the suttas in there is about the stream. It's called the stream. And the stream is a stream of the sensory world, the stream of craving, the desire. And when we're talking about craving, usually we mean craving in the realm of the five senses. And what it says, it says that there is this person sitting on this raft in the middle of the stream, and they're kind of sailing along, and the sun is out, and the banks are beautiful and the raft is comfortable, the water is just the right temperature, and they're hanging on this raft and going down the stream, going down the stream of craving, following along the stream of craving. Now, what they don't know, but this is what the Buddha knows, the Buddha is looking at the distance, and the Buddha can see this is a man with good eyesight, or maybe a woman with good eyesight, looking at that person, and they can see the river after going around the bend, there is a pool. And in that pool, what are there in that pool? There are sharks. There are crocodiles. There are whirlpools. Yeah, there are all these problems. If you get to that pool and the crocodile is hungry, you're in trouble. Hungry crocodiles and human beings means no human being. It means bones and all kinds of stuff. But the human being, the crocodile just spits out the bones after it's finished with you. And then that's all that is left of you. Have you seen some of these crocodiles? They are enormous. In Australia, we have crocodiles. They're called salties. They're saltwater crocodiles. They can be up to six meters long. And they will just have you for lunch, just like that. And that will be the end of you. They're a really scary animal, I can tell you. And they have this incredibly sharp teeth, these jaws that will just crush you to bits. And these eyes without any emotions, right? No emotions. They have. You can't talk to them and say, oh, okay, please, please be kind doesn't work with crocodile. They eat you regardless. So that's kind of the problem with crocodiles. If it's a, a tiger, maybe you will be okay. But crocodile, no chance at all. Uh, so if you think tigers are scary, crocodile is much more scary. So this is what you see, right? And this is kind of the problem with this idea of the five sense world. That we're moving down the stream. Everything seems so delightful. The sensory realm seems beautiful. Nice relationships. Nice food, yeah, a beautiful kind of entertainment, uh, yeah, and all of these kind of things. Uh, we have no idea where that stream is heading. Uh, goes around the corner, the whirlpools and all the problems are there. This is how the sutta goes. Uh. So this is kind of the problem of this world when we kind of stand back and look at it. Uh, it is kind of concerning. Uh, and so letting go a little bit of interest in that world is a good thing here. Uh. Just withdrawing a little bit, seeing the kind of bird's eye view of what is going on there. And when we do that, we allow the mind to access deeper states of meditation. This is the number one problem for meditation, the fact that we are too attached to that world. Give up a little bit. It means that we can let go of the five senses a bit more. We can let go of the body a little bit more. Just a little bit of contemplation of that world will ensure your mind goes to a deeper level in the future. So this is very interesting if you are a someone who's keen on meditation practice, uh, and you will see how this actually works. So, so this is a little bit about the background, why the five sense world is worth contemplating. And I again, I want to remind you, this is really just for contemplation. 
and not for taking dramatic measures uh, about how you should live, uh, just for contemplation and then see how what kind of effect it has in your life. So this is where this sutta comes in. We're just going to give it a very brief start today because uh, we're running out of time as usual, of course. <laughs> So we're going to just have a quick look at how this, book, this sutta starts, and then we are, uh, yeah, that's going to be good enough. So here you go. At one time, the Buddha was staying in the land of the Malas, near the Malian town named Uruvela Kappa. So the Malas, this is in the north of uh, India, north of the river Ganges, not so far from Savati and Kushinara, that area. Actually, Kushinara is the capital of the Malans usually. So it's in that area. Then the Buddha robed up in the morning and taking his bowl and robe, he entered Uruvela Kappa for arms. Yeah, this is what you see in the present day. The monastics go into the town or the village for alms food. And even the Buddha would do that in those days. It's kind of inspiring. Imagine the Buddha coming on arms round. Wouldn't that be cool? How would you feel if the Buddha came on arms round? If you were going to offer arms to the Buddha, we'd be like, oh, scary. <laughs> it would be kind of awe-inspiring yeah, to have the Buddha come. And uh, Of course, the Malians, I don't know if they really understood what was going on. Uh, so they probably just, oh, yeah, a bit of rice for the Buddha. And I didn't know what was happening. Yeah. But uh, for us, it's different because we have all that history behind it. Then after the meal, on his return from arms round, he addressed Venerable Ananda. Ananda, you stay right here while I plunge deep into the great wood for the day's abiding, yeah, for the, day, the day's meditation. This was a standard thing that the Buddha would do after a day after the meal. And he was said to practice the Maha Karuna meditation, the great compassion. This was what he would do, especially after the meal, apparently. So they would go into the, into the great wood, the Mahavana. And uh, this was a typical place where the monastics would hang out. And that's where they would do the meditation practice in the great wood. So uh, that doesn't mean that they were left in peace because other people would also plunge into that great wood uh, looking for the Buddha. Where's the Buddha? Which, which tree is it sitting at? And he never, he, getting peace was very difficult for the Buddha after he became famous. Yes, sir, Ananda replied. Then the Buddha plunged deep into the great wood and sat at the root of a tree for the day's abiding, for the day's meditation. The household of Tapusa went up to Venerable Ananda, bowed, sat down to one side, and said to him, Honorable Ananda, we are lay people who enjoy sensual pleasures. We like sensual pleasures. We love sensual pleasures. And we take joy in sensual pleasures. Being very honest. And <laughs> straight to the point, yeah, so you can see. Lay people are the same then as they are now. Nothing has changed. I don't know. Are, are you like that? I, is, <laughs> everyone likes essential pleasures, yeah? And uh, one of the interesting things that the Buddha says in the sutta is, unless you gain a meditation state, uh, unless you gain something which is higher than the sensory world, you are going to incline towards sensual pleasures. Uh, so it is natural that it is to be expected that these things happen. And even as a monastic, this is going to happen. You are going to enjoy your food. If you don't get some good meditation, you are going to, your mind is going to incline towards the sensual pleasures of the world. And this is why it is so important for monastics to have enough time off. You can meditate. You can actually access some of that happiness. Because as a monastic, if you don't get the happiness of meditation, of withdrawing from sensual pleasures, well, then you have no happiness. And then if you have no happiness, your mind is going to incline towards sensual pleasures. And before, before you know it, you, I'm going to sit down there with you guys, and, some, and the venerable here is going to sit up here and give us the teaching. Yeah. He's going to tell us that, actually, you made a mistake. You give too many teachings, you forgot to look after your own practice. And that would be true. So that's why it is very important when you see monastics, you should encourage them to make sure they get enough seclusion. Because without that seclusion, there is no happiness for a monastic. Yeah? Because the sensual realm is less accessible. You can still enjoy your food, but many, many things are taken off the plate. You can't really do those things anymore. Yeah? 
So that is kind of the problem. Uh, so um, this is how monastic life should work. Yeah. But renunciation seems like an abyss. Isn't that kind of interesting? Yeah. Renunciation is like an abyss. It's like a uh, it's like a precipice. Yeah, you come there, you fall down, and there's nothing there, nothing to enjoy. How can anyone enjoy renunciation? And uh, this is, I think, a very common uh, theme and why people don't kind of become monastics, because it seems so dangerous to become monastics. Yeah, you're giving up the pleasures of the world. Am I going to get anything in return? Am I going to get the happiness of meditation? And if you have no understanding of what that happiness is, it does seem like you're giving things up and getting nothing in return. That is the abyss. Yeah, There's nothing there. This is a big problem. Huh? And so to be able to understand kind of the idea of renunciation, the only way we can understand that is to understand that the purpose of renunciation is, of course, to move towards something else that is more profound, more interesting than the sensual pleasures. That is when it becomes possible. Yeah, But this is really how a lot of people think about renunciation. I have sometimes told people, people you know, have asked me, why do you become a monk for? That's kind of madness. I mean, most of you are Buddhists. So for you, it is kind of, you know, you, you kind of have a, already kind of grown up or you have, have an understanding of what is going on. But imagine ordinary people in the West, yeah, in the world, where I come from, Norway, and I say, you become like, you're crazy, what do you become a monk for? That's kind of mad. And they have this idea of the abyss, right? That there's no, how can you, there's no enjoyment, there's no happiness, yeah? What on earth are you doing torturing yourself with that shaven head and those weird robes? Yeah, come back, yeah, enjoy yourself with us. We will show you how to enjoy the world. Yeah? That's what happens, so it is not so remember that you are already Buddhist, you've been Buddhist for so long. So it may not be so easy for you to understand how many people see these things. So anyway. And he says, I have heard that in this teaching and training, there are very young mendicants whose minds are eager for renunciation. They are confident, settled, and decided about it. They see it as peaceful. Renunciation is the dividing line between the multitude and the mendicants in this teaching and training. Yeah, so he is kind of astonished. Very young mendicants, yeah, young people who go forth and whose minds are eager for renunciation. In other words, eager to abandon attachment to the sensory world. They are confident, settled, and decided about it. And this is the idea. This only happens really when you have good meditation and samadhi, or the mind moves towards samadhi, then you're also settled about renunciation, because samadhi is renunciation. When we talk about renunciation, what we really mean is we're, we mean that craving and desire for the five sense world. That is what, what is meant by renunciation. It doesn't mean becoming a monastic. It means that giving up of the interest in the five sense world. Yeah, and they see this as peaceful. Yeah, these, these monastics. And this is what this tapusa is really confused about. How is this possible? How can you see this as peaceful, right? This abyss, as it seems to them. And then it says quite rightly that the uh, renunciation is the dividing line between the multitude, the ordinary people, and the mendicants, uh, the monastics in this teaching and discipline, uh, or this teaching and training. This is the Dhamma Vinaya. On the one hand, the lay people. On the other hand, the monastics. And it's very hard to see eye to eye. How can we understand this? Uh, what can we do to bridge this gap uh, between the lay people and the monastics? Uh, what is going on here? Then, uh, Venerable Ananda says, Householder, we should see the Buddha about this matter. Come, let's go to the Buddha and inform him about this. As he answers, so we will remember it. Yes, sir, replied Tapusa. Then Ananda, together with Tapusa, went to the Buddha, sat down to one side. Ananda told him what had happened.
And the Buddha says, that is so true, Ananda, that is so true. And then the Buddha goes on and he gives an explanation from his point of view for what is going on. And I am going to leave you there on the cliff, edge of the cliff, hanging. So you are really excited and tomorrow you will come back and you will actually come interested in what the Buddha is going to say. Because we're just running out of time. It's very convenient for me to say that. So we're running out of time. <laughs> So I think it is a good place to stop, actually. Um, and given you whetted your appetite for this particular sutta, and then tomorrow we will carry on. But let's uh, have another short break, do a little bit more meditation. And if you need to stretch your leg or so, please, please feel free to do so. Now.